Hey, Bible students, we have question time again. And this time, a question that will really challenge everybody. Should we pray for the dead? Now, I want to deal with the question exactly as it was asked of us. So we will do that in a minute. But I want to just mention again that we all should be asking questions, that this is the whole idea, really, of a Bible student's approach is to ask questions and to seek for answers. So what better could we say than to turn to Matthew 7, verse 7, and see what the Lord said himself, ask, and it will be given to you, seek, and you will find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So the Lord is 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 really requesting of us to use that procedure to try to answer the questions we have. And this question is a question which I would think is coming from a sincere mind. And I do know, although I've not been uh, especially dealt having to deal with this problem myself personally, I have met people who are, and uh, I consider this question a, a very serious question. And I'll try to do the best I can from the Bible uh, concerning the answer. So if we, if we go into the question itself, it was in three parts, and it, it led uh, people into the actual idea at the end rather than at the beginning. So the beginning was, how can modern day believers be empowered by God's spirit to spread the good news and to be given strength and guidance for daily living? And I, I believe that question is coming from people who have read the Bible and who see that well, the spirit was given in the first century and, and people could actually raise the dead. So why can't we? Good question. But when you look at what the Bible has to say about this is what Bible students would do. They wouldn't come to a quick answer. They would survey the Bible to find out what the, the answer is in the overall sense. I think this is a good passage to start from. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, Love never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, that would be a sign that I think any Bible student would be really wondering, what could it possibly mean that prophecies will fail? Do you really mean that what God has prophesied won't come to pass? No, that, that's not what it means. Neither does it mean that the gift of tongues would uh, mean that uh, not only would it cease, but there would be no one who would be preaching the gospel, and neither would there be any knowledge available to preach it from. Now, he's speaking specifically about the spirit gifts here. And so my answer would be, how can prophecies fail? The gift of prophecy would cease. And it's only passed on, as we see from the scriptures, through the laying on hands of the apostles. So all the gifts would cease with the death of the last apostle. Like, that's just a, a natural. If it was only received by the laying on of hands, and the Bible attests to that, and that being the hands of the apostles, then when the apostles have died, then there is no one else to pass on the spirit gifts. So these gifts that people had, which Jesus gave the power to them to go out and to heal the sick and to strengthen people and, and even to raise the dead, those gifts would cease, is what the Bible tells us, I believe, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. But agape continues. Now, that's a very important point, because this is what the Spirit was to lead up to. It was to lead people to develop a character, to develop a way of dealing with the problems of life, a way of dealing with other people, a way of approaching God. And it's summed up by, well, in the English version quite often, it's, it's, termed, it's termed charity or it's termed love. But I prefer, as many Bible students do, to use the Greek word agape because there really isn't any English word to translate the meaning that's given to that word in the New Testament. So when we say that, we mean what the Bible means in 1 Corinthians 13, for instance, when it describes 
agape. So here's another passage. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, it states, Now he that establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Well, what is the guarantee about? Well, we know that some first century believers had the powers of the Holy Spirit, so that in an ecclesia or a group of believers in the first century, there would be people who had the powers of the Holy Spirit. Well, when we look at what those powers were like, it was like, first of all, a down payment. It was it was just a little taste of what was to come. Well, when was it going to be given in the full sense? Well, it was to be given at his coming. When the Lord Jesus comes and people are made immortal, who have been mortal otherwise, they will then be given the spirit power to do these things uh, in a much greater way than they ever had been in their life as a mortal. So that's what I think it means. And it's the people in the first century that are talking. So the Apostle Paul says, that, yes, we have been sealed because the Bible has given us or God has given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee of what is to come. That's an interesting thought just to tuck away while we're dealing with this subject. And then it came in Romans 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, notice that, that tucked away in that verse, it says that the gospel is the power of God to the believer. So we've got to try to figure out what is this power that's related to the gospel itself. Well, power through the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom that can be gained from it. That's the power. And people are enabled to do things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do if it wasn't for the knowledge they have, the understanding they have of the gospel, and the wisdom that they have been given through that knowledge and understanding. And this power provides motivation. And it is not to be discounted. For instance, it's not to be, well, I don't have the power to raise the dead, so I don't have any power. No, God has given us what is really the work of the Holy Spirit in the fir first century, when it was giving the scriptures to people, the uh, understanding that God wanted people to have, they became powerful through that understanding. And that word is used and traced through the New Testament quite strongly. So it is for everyone now who believes. So for people who believe, yes, there is a power given to them, but it is not the power associated with the spirit gifts in the first century. Now the questioner goes on. He mentions or she mentions, it is our tradition to pray for the family and friends only. But would Christadelphians find it acceptable to pray for the dead person as well? Now, this is not telling us uh, who this dead person is that they have in mind, whether it's a, a parent that has died many, many years ago, whether it is someone who died tragically just recently, or whether it is a child that has just died. So we empathize with the feelings that people have at this time, but we're looking for an answer to this question. Well, first of all, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord uses this sense of being dead in a spiritual way. We must need to acknowledge this. And to the angel of the ecclesia at Sardis write, These things saith he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Now, how could people be dead and alive at the same time? Well, that's not hard for uh, a Bible student to understand, because we, we, uh, we ask ourselves, why would we pray for the dead? Here's a reason. If the people are spiritually dead, yes. Because these people were actually still living, but from God's point of view, because of the way they were living, it was as if they were dead, as if they hadn't learned anything from the Bible, or as if they were disregarding it. They knew what was right, but they weren't doing it. So we pray for these people, yes, 
because we're seeking their repentance. We're seeking for them to turn around while they still have life. Here's another one. Psalm 49, verse 7. It says, None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Now, this is quite limiting. This is not talking about people who are spiritually dead. This is talking about people who have died physically. So if you're physically dead, we cannot redeem another person from the power of the grave. We do not have the power to do that. And that's what that verse means. Bible students are limited to Bible answers. Like it's no use being a Bible student and then going off and coming up with something that the Bible doesn't support. We want to find a Bible verse, and it would seem to me that all Christadelphians would have that same principle in mind. They would consult the Bible before they would give their answer. Now, here's another one. It's a little stronger. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, here was a case. David had lost a son. It was a very young child, but nevertheless, it had died, and he didn't know it at the time, and so at the time that he, uh, he was hoping it, it would not die, it would get well, um, he prayed for it. But when it died, he ceased to pray for it. And the people were wondering just why it was that his behavior had changed so suddenly. So uh, Paul, or sorry, David says in verse 23, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So I would say, here's an example. It's not just a teaching, it's an example of what happened. David prayed while the child was physically alive, but after the child died, he was restrained. He did not go on praying after the child had died. In other words, it would seem that God had told him that that was his answer, and David received that answer. He did not continue to pray for the dead child. Now, for people who have had a child who died, that would be a statement that would be hard to accept. But when you look at the Bible and you seek to get your answers from the Bible, what more can we do but find an example and say, well, that's how God sees it. Now, it goes on with a further question. It says, what is the official stance about what will happen to babies and children when Jesus returns? If they have died before they have been given the opportunity to believe in Jesus and be baptized. Now, there's two parts to this question. I'd like to answer the first part. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, These things we also speak, not in, in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Like that's what God has given us to try to understand the difficult questions of life. You just go back and you see other scriptures. And if you think there's one that, that gives you an answer, well, look at others to see if, if they're, you know, in step with that. Because that is the blessing of God giving his spirit uh, word by the process of inspiration. That God does not contradict himself. If we think it, he does, it's because of our lack of understanding. It's not because God actually does. So when we see things that we're having a hard time with, keep looking into the scriptures. There's no official stance that Christadelphians have this. There have been various articles written about it. There have been people who have experienced it and have, and have uh, showed what they've dealt, how they've dealt with it. But it's not as if we consult a book as Christadelphians. And this is what happens when a child dies and uh, you've got to follow that procedure. No, we're, we're Bible students. And we look up what the Bible has to say. So personal persuasion around the verses that establish the principle is how we come to our belief. And uh, in many cases, it's been wise that Christadelphians have not gone to every little aspect of life and said, this is the official thing. This is what you have to do. Bible students to some extent, I think, rejoice in the fact that they have the liberty to open the Bible and see for themselves. But the Bible says that once dead, there are no thoughts of that person until the resurrection, if in fact they are raised. 
You see, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So some seek help through resurrection. But who is going to be resurrected? The Bible is explicit. Resurrection is followed by judgment. Now, if resurrection is followed by judgment, and that is coupled together, and it it can't be disconnected in the Bible, then why is it that we would think that a child could be raised again, or a person could be raised again, as the case may be, if we don't also have to deal with them going to, to judgment? See, babies and children are not the subjects of judgment. God doesn't raise a a one-month-old baby to judge it for what it has done. Here's the principle that he's given in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Answer? Well, this verse describes the judgment that those exposed to the gospel must consider. There is no context for children in this Bible passage. I think everyone would agree that children will not be called to judgment for what they have done, what they have done in the body, whether it is being good or bad, because we can't find a context in the Bible for the resurrection of children to give them a chance they never had, to give them a second chance or whatever. God just is silent about that. And we have the example of of David, who had a child, a young child. He prayed for it until it died. When it died, he did not pray for it afterwards. That would be what I think a Bible student's answer is to this question. So what matters is what the Bible states. That's the conclusion that I think a Bible student has to come to. And that's, I believe, what the Bible has to say about this matter. So we pray for the dead if they're spiritually dead. If they are dead in the literal sense, no, there is no nothing we can do. We can't redeem them from the grave, and there would be no sense in us praying for someone whom God will not raise. That's what we give for our answers today. We ask you to continue to ask questions because that is the, the basis on which Bible students get stronger in what they believe. We, we don't shy away from questions. We do the best we can do to answer them, but from the Bible. Until the next time, may God bless your study of his word. Thank you.